thank you for being here on um, this amped up new version of Positive Peeps, uh, getting started and kicking it off with Michael Markowitz. Yes. Michael, how many times do people mispronounce your oh, last name? Plenty, plenty. <laughs> uh, what, what versions have you heard? Markovich, <laughs> Markiewicz. Marko, so does uh, that yeah. mean you go in for like Polish roles, Jewish roles, Italian? <laughs> you can play anything. Yep, yep. Which versatile. actually is something I'm going to get to. Um, you're, we'll, we'll get to that. Um, as you can see, he's a very handsome, striking guy <laughs> with an insane beard. Don't make beard. me blush. You can't see the blush <laughs> through the beard. <laughs> All right. So we have Michael Markowitz here. And uh, how did me and Michael meet? This is how all my positive peeps people that I come into my life. It's when I find someone that I find so extraordinarily positive. I feel like I'm a positive guy. But when I meet someone that their light is shining brighter than I'm used to. And we only met for two minutes. Yeah. Yeah. Two minutes. And um, I knew I wanted to keep in touch with this guy. And we kept in touch. And that character, Lonnie Perkins, apparently was the baddest dude ever. He was a, a neo-Nazi. Yeah. Uh, he ran like a, he was like the head of the Aryan front. Yeah. So he had like people everywhere. He was a major killer. And if he got out, he had a lot of power and was going to do a lot of damage. And the irony is the guy playing the head of the Aryan front, the scariest dude that the whole episode was about freeing him and me stopping him because <laughs> that is played by the nicest guy ever. So let's get into it. We're going to find out the source of this right. positivity <laughs> that comes out of this intense, scary looking, uh. nice guy. All right. No, you're not scary. Looking. No. Uh. Uh, well, OK. So anyway, so he's an actor. He's a supermodel. <laughs> he's a survivor. He's a husband, a son, a brother, and now a father. Hey. And he's a positive peep. Michael, welcome. Oh, thank you so much. That introduction, I, <laughs> you blew me away. Thank you so much. It's true. Okay, where are you born? Staten Island. Born and raised. Still and, there. Yep, still there. Yep, yep. How old are you, if I may? Me, 37. 37. Yeah. And born in Staten Island, and have you lived anywhere else? No, no, I haven't. I love being New York-based. It's very easy to get to Manhattan, so, you know, I like it. So I know you've always been into sports and fitness yeah, and so forth. Was there a time when you were growing up that you sort of knew you had a predilection for fitness or talent for sports? And then also follow up to that is when you knew you had sort of a, a predilection for the arts, for acting. With fitness and sports, I always grew up, you know, I was very fortunate to grow up with a lot of friends like that. We lived maybe three blocks from each other. Yeah. So it was like 15 of us. Still your friends. Still right? my friends. Yeah, those are my guys too. Right? We call ourselves the B6 <laughs> from kindergarten and fifth grade and everything. Chris Rock said the only real friends you have are the ones you met on the playground. Right, right. I mean, you can and how friends, important though. is that? Is that not mm -hmm. important to have? My mom calls it a treasure chest for life. Right. And when you were growing up, did you kind of think that everybody had those types of relationships or no? I didn't think about it until I was older when I realized that the, no one makes me laugh harder than the guys. And they don't care if you're on TV or you're, you're fired. It doesn't matter. who They will bust your balls. <laughs> right. They will call you out and they will remember things that you, they'll know you better than yourself. There's nothing, right. nothing like, honestly, if I'm sometimes not feeling great, I just want to go hang out with one of my old, old school friends. It is important, you know, so we were playing for baseball, basketball, dodgeball, kickball. And did you, know, you started to kind of sort of was clear that you were a head and shoulders above them in those sports? Did you start, start like you, you excelled? Yes. Like around like fifth grade is when I started to get a little bit better and better and better because you're playing it all day. And then I started playing with older kids, especially basketball. You know, you get on the playground, you're maybe like 12, 13, you're playing with people 16, 17, and 18. You were, and you were winning. Yeah. Yeah. Shooter. Yeah. Dunker? Yes. Yeah, no, 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 not dunker. Ball no. handler? No, no, I was shoot. I was a shooter for sure. You know, so from there, basketball is really what I excelled at the most. Nice. And then from there, I played like AAU basketball. You did? And then, yeah, yeah, yeah. No kidding. Yeah. That's competitive. For people who don't know, all the NBA and professional athletes, that's where all, they all start out. That's where they start getting plucked. That's amazing. I played for Staten Island Lightning, Staten. and then they had Staten Island Stingrays. So I played, you know. Yeah. Staten Island. Like, <laughs> the Staten Island Stingrays. This is, I feel like I want to go to Staten Island with you and see a game by the Staten Island Stingrays. Yeah. <laughs> Those were the two travel teams. So it was good because playing um, CYO basketball and then, you know, it was kind of like the best players 
on the island would, you know, go on the travel team. You know, I'm not saying we were the best team <laughs> by any means, you but it was own. fun. It was fun to play against better competition because then you got better. So inside of that, I, I know maybe this started later. Um, and, you know, we've seen photos of you in high school and you're a fit guy. You were like, so were you always naturally fit? And like, when did you start getting into like working out and like, like a fitness guy? Is that later or that it was just yeah, happening then? It was probably about um, when you saw that photo, probably around like 16. Yeah. It was 15, 16 is where I started getting into like weight training and things mm -hmm. like that around like uh, freshman, sophomore year of high school. Did you do that because um, uh, you wanted to like look good for, for the girls? Did you do it <laughs> just because it felt good? You could get out the aggression or you just something to do? Were you bored? What, what, what made you go into weight training? It was kind of like everything. Just I liked everything about it. It was just another thing to get better at. You know, it was like I got in there and it's like just like anything else, you want to just get better at it and you want to get stronger. You want to get fitter. So everybody. it kind of became a routine. Not everybody has that where they naturally want to get better at things and naturally find a routine, especially at 15 or 16. Yeah. So that's that's the stuff that I'm I'm often interested in. Like you want to get better. It's the beginning of wanting to get better as a person too. Starts with the body, starts with, you know, in school, you know, and there's a lot of things to distract one in high school and so forth. Is this something your mom taught you or your parents taught you? Or I know you're really close with your granddad. Did, yeah. Did that, is that just something you had or is that something that you taught? Was taught? You know, it was, it's funny because anything else that I picked up, I just kind of learned from my friends. It wasn't like, um, cause I didn't grow up with my father. You know, my grandfather was, you know, he served in the Marines and stuff like that, but uh -huh. he had a certain discipline. But I always kind of was just like my friends just loved playing, uh, you know, sports and stuff. So it's like being around all those people, you kind of get a competitive fire. Mm -hmm. And hopefully that lasts with you through everything that you do. So mm -hmm. I kind of got a competitiveness to me. Mm -hmm. And it's like any th new thing that I picked up that I might not have been good at and stuff like that. I'm like, man, I got to get better. I got to get better. You are a product of your environment. So it sounds like you were very fortunate to have... Um, those friends. Yeah. And I think about it now, you know, it's even you just asking the me that. <laughs> I the look back. I think about all the good fortunes in my life and I can attribute it so much to my upbringing. Yeah. Every group does some crazy things. You know, you always get into, you know, trouble and things it's like that. Passage. Right. You know, just like you and your friends, me and my friends have crazy stories. And we, we think about it nowadays and we're like, oh man, can you, can you believe that? You know, the best. but it makes you better. And you just like, you were able to look back at that and just Stuff laugh. I forgot. And then they're like, they won't let you forget. So you grew up without your dad. Yeah. If yeah. I may. He lived uh, in Brooklyn. They were so, separated when you yeah, were Yeah, they young? were separated. Yeah, when I was like maybe four years old. Do you old? remember him being around when you were little? Yeah, a little bit. Not much, though, to be honest with and you. And did you have a relationship with him when he, you were growing he, up? He came around like every Sunday, you know, for, okay, for cool. visits and stuff, which was which is good, you know. And um, Did you bond on those Sundays or was it a little bit? Uh, yeah. He would take us to the arcade and stuff and you, you know, and your my brother, me and my brother. brother. Yeah. He's Older two brother? and a half years younger than me. Oh yeah, your younger brother. Yeah. yeah your big brother. It's crazy because no matter what, you kind of always want, even though you're not close with a family, with your father or something like that, from my instance, from my perspective, it's like you still want that approval. But even though they, they don't even have much to do with your life and stuff like that, it's a crazy thing. But you know that you still want to to feel validated in a certain way, you know? I couldn't relate more. Um, great relationship with my dad. He's a surgeon, worked really hard, role model for hard work, was worried about me being an actor, uh, but then got behind it when he saw that I was committed. I just did a play. I just did a Broadway show. Right, right, yes, yeah. congratulations, yeah. Thank you very much. Half the story was me wanting his dad's approval to a fault, right? to a fault. And um, I didn't realize how much I related to that. And sort of the, the greatest moment of the run for me was on opening night. My dad was there. Amazing. And after the curtain call, we're all walking off stage and the lights come up. I look back, I see dad. Oh, the best. That is amazing. It was like, I felt lighter right after the moment, just to see him be able to come and he was worried about me. And you know, the fact that he could see that and be there for that, I count my blessings. My mom was like, oh, do you, do you, you know, you have only two opening night tickets, you know, do you want to take someone else? I was like, don't you understand? I want right. you and dad How much there? it means to you. Yeah. I, there's nothing better than having my parents alive with me right now. Right. So your dad comes around, you have a relationship with him. Yeah. You still have a relationship with him? Oh, he passed away in 2010, I believe it was, 2010. And yeah. his father, which is your grandfather, 
was the Marine who you're My grandfather was my mother's uh, father. So your father's side, do you have relationships with his family? Um, not too much. Like my cousins now that I'm older, I have Found a little bit other. more, yeah, a little bit more um, of a relationship with them now. Nice. Growing up, not so much. We didn't really keep in contact, you know? If, if I may, you don't have to answer this, anything you're not comfortable with. What was the basis of their separation? My dad was a cheater, <laughs> plain and simple. You know, he was, I have a few half brothers, half sisters, oh. you know, that I only knew about at his funeral. You know, I went there and I started seeing people who look like me, you know, and I was like, like there's six of us that we know about. <laughs> so it's here, here you are at your father's funeral. You just lost your dad. And then you discover all these new family members. Yeah, it was kind of strange, you know, it was like, can only imagine because I've never met any like, uh, I've heard the name once before, but I haven't, you know, ever seen them face to face in touch with them. Or was it strange? Or did it take time or not really? No, we don't keep in contact really. Uh, one, we're friends on um, Facebook and stuff. At the end of the day, it's still blood, you yeah. know, so it's it's a weird situation because I'm like, you want to connect. But then it's like, how do you form that relationship? And it's like, where do you go from there? And Uncle Zach, I don't want to. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. If I may. Yeah. Starts with a hello. Right, right. Starts with a hello. Yeah. That's important, like, especially now that I have a son. It's like, you want, I want a, a big family, a tight knit family. So you hit it on the head. <laughs> All right. So but, but, real quick, what does your mom do? Or? She was a paraprofessional, like a, um, with um, special education people and um, kids. At school. Okay. I knew it. Yeah. I knew, like, I knew that's special. <laughs> yeah. Where did, how did she get into that? And that's what you witnessed growing up. You witnessed somebody helping those in need. It was in junior high when she got into it. And it's funny. What did she do before then? She She's in real estate. Okay. She worked at the toll booths. She was a private investigator. Whoa. Uh, yeah. So, so she's, she's been through a lot. She's seen a lot. <laughs> Just the yeah. toll booths alone, you get to see <laughs> everything in life. Yeah. You mentioned to me an another time that your grandfather was sort of like a father figure to you. He was the male figure in my life, you know, on a day to day. He took me to school, you know. Wow. Yeah. And he, he was, was a Marine. Yeah. So one he one. was no nonsense, disciplined. He was one of the most laid back people you've ever met in your life. Just a good yeah. human being, yeah. like a, just a good. The, warrior, the warriors person. are always the teddy yeah. bears. It yeah. was. It's you know. I that's. I wish he was here now, um, just so I can have a conversation and just because you know how you go through life, and I'm sure you feel the same way. It's like you want advice from somebody specific, and it's like in his case, he's not here, and I wish that there's certain things that I can speak to him about, you know, and and just really be like, what do you think about this? What do you think about that? And it's like when they're not here to, um, you know, be there for you. It's, it's tough. He is. Yeah. I believe that. I do. And you can talk to him. He'll tell you what to do. Yeah. Cause you know what to do. Yeah. I believe that. I strongly do. I talked to my grandmother who I never met. I just mm. heard stories about her and she is my North star. Yeah. He's, that he's here. Yeah, I, I know that I can feel sometimes like at, at times where I'm like, you're having a bad day and you just, you look to, you look to the sky, you just talk like, and I do, I find myself sometimes just sitting there and I, you know, I talk to her and I'm like, man, you just feel a presence. It's, um, it's kind of incredible when you, when you think about it like that. Speaking of that, you get diagnosed with cancer. Yeah. Higher presence, how to get through it. Um, and you had your grandfather at that time. Yes. So um, you got diagnosed at 16. Yeah. So mm -hmm. what were the symptoms that you experienced before you were diagnosed? How did you know to go to the doctor? And then what was your diagnosis? This was like November 2002. I remember I was at the gym and I was doing like tricep press downs, right? And I just felt a strain in my groin. And I'm like, it really hurt to the point where I've, you felt like you got hit below the belt. Oh. And I was like, man, I couldn't shake the feeling and I and I was like making me nauseous. I was, it was really bad. I sat out and I'm like, I'm watching the team practice and everything. I'm like, man, I got to play. So I went, I played and it just hurt even more. And I'm like, man, like this is, this is a weird feeling. I never felt anything like that. Even when I got hit, you know, I'm like, damn, this hurts. So my mother's like, I'm going to bring you to the emergency room. 
takes me to the emergency room. They did an ultrasound and they're like, oh, um, at this point. <laughs> an ultrasound of your. Of my yeah. testicles. Yeah. And they, I didn't know what, you know, benign, malignant. I had no clue what this stuff meant at the time. No clue. So, you know, they tell my mother like, oh, um, there's a mass there and hopefully it's benign. You know, and I'm like, my mother's crying now. And I'm like, she crying about, you know, the doctor said it was nothing. Because the last time when I went to the doctor, yeah. they're saying it's nothing. So I'm like, oh, and then, you know, she told me what it was. I still didn't even, didn't even comprehend. I'm just like, okay, you know, I'm going to go hang out with my friends or whatever, even though I was in pain. So what happened was I wound up going to see another doctor. An um, oncologist? Yes. And um, they knew right away. Like, I think they told me on a Wednesday, they're like, oh, it's test. He, as soon as he saw, he goes, testicular cancer. Um, they did my blood work to make sure and everything, my tumor markers and everything. So it was a Wednesday. They're like, we need to do surgery on Monday. What was that Wednesday to Monday like? Like I was hysterical because as soon as I heard cancer, I thought I was done. And then was there anything, um, uh, you know, as a guy, a high school guy, when they say it's your, your testicles, like. What was what was that 100%. experience like? You know, it's not like cancer of the shoulder. It's no, cancer you, of your of your jewels. Yeah, your family no, jewels. You're thinking, you know, oh my God, is it gonna? What's it gonna look like? A oh. girl's gonna notice. Uh, you know, all you think about at that age is you're hanging out with your friends, girls, sports. That's I can't even think of anything. Did you else. tell anyone? And that was five days. Yeah, friends. Like I, Close friends. you know, they came over right away. We all hung out, and it was like, yeah, it was such a support system. It made me feel like, oh, I can do this. Those were the ones in those five days that got you. You thought you were done, and it was in those five days that they got you back to, I can do this. Yeah, family, friends, everyone really like rallied, and it was like, wow, yeah, great group. Yeah. Great group. It was it. incredible. It. So then on Monday, so on Monday I get the surgery. Everything was, looked okay. You know, they, they, they removed, had it. They, they had, removed they, one. Yeah, they removed one. And they bring a jar. <laughs> like, oh, here it is. I'm like, oh, it's great. <laughs> what do you want me to do? Hang it on my keychain? I'm going to start my car and have my... <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> I have my ball hanging. I'm like, what, I'm like, what, what do you want uh, me to do with that? What, what did you do with it? Where, where is that? I don't know where it is. I have no... <laughs> I'm like, why even show it's me? It's like somebody's wall. Yeah, yeah, they come out with the jar. You know, uh, maybe when I get really famous, they'll put it on a, you know, it'll go for auction. Who knows who has it? But um, <laughs> I was like, okay, you know, December, they tell me that the, um, what they removed was a high risk tumor. And they said, usually it will, tra it will travel to my lymph nodes mm -hmm. it, it, when they remove a high risk tumor. So like in case of it traveling, we want to remove your lymph nodes. It'd be a 96% chance nothing comes back. We cut you from like the, the breastbone all the way down past the belly button down, you know, so I was like, it was the, did they say chemo as well? Not at that point. So you mm -hmm. didn't know that that was coming after you had your first surgery. No, I, I had no clue. I had no clue that that was coming. So you so. thought you were in the clear. Yeah. I thought that everything was good. What was it like when you received the news that you now had to have a major surgery? I'm like, you gotta be kidding. Because to be honest, it was, I was really pissed off. Uh, I'm nervous, pissed at the same time. I'm like, okay, now I'm gonna have a scar from here to here. I'm like, what's next? You know, like it wasn't that hard of a decision to do because if you're telling me a 96% chance nothing was going to come back, then let's just, let's do it, you know? So <laughs> this is a, then there's another story. They say, okay, you know, just in case we don't know uh, if you're going to be able to have kids and stuff after this. So, you know, you're going to have to go to a sperm bank mm -hmm. and, and, and deposit <laughs> as they say. <laughs> So, You're 16. I'm 16. Now my grandfather and my uncle are taking me to the sperm bank. <laughs> I'm, like, I'm like, I don't even know what to do. So I come in. They're like, oh, they give me this Sorry. plastic cup. And you're just like, oh, great. Go do your business. I'm 16 years old. I'm like, this is what my life has come down to. <laughs> I'm sorry. I said, <laughs> I'm looking around. I'm like, uh, you know, my uncle and my my uh, grandfather waiting in the car for me. And now I got to go. Well, can I, I'm going to admit something to you. Yeah. I have frozen sperm as well. Okay, good. So my mom said, but not enough men freeze their sperm. They don't realize that they can have cancer. They can get into an accident. They can get hurt. Something can happen. And it's just an investment in the future. So I said, sure. So right. I, I, uh, I invested uh, in the bank, in the sperm bank as well. <laughs> should have called me. I put a layaway for the future. <laughs> and um, yeah, everyone's surprised when yeah. they find out. I'm like, and they're like, oh, oh. So did you end up having, 
have I didn't to have use? to use it. No, I didn't have to use it. And, and then I go get the surgery. So that was one of the hardest things. They had to put me on like a laxative for a little bit. And then they put you on like a five gram a day diet. So you couldn't even have a, like a potato chip. So I lost, I think it was probably 30 pounds. Oh my God. Give and take. I think I was like 175 when I went into the hospital and then I got out at like 145 you or something like that. stay in the hospital during your recovery? I stayed in the hospital for, I think it was 12 days. In 12 days you lost though? Like, I lost a lot of weight. Did the nutrients, did you just, were you just like having insanely hungry and headaches? <laughs> I, you know, it kept you Whoa. calm, but I was on a lot of morphine too. And they said, you can't leave until you get off it and you go to the bathroom yourself. At that point, I don't know that you can't stop things cold turkey, you know? So I stopped it oh and like cold God. turkey and you nobody even told me it. I started smelling things that weren't there. I started telling everybody they stink. I was telling my mother, you stink. I was going nuts. People hear the cancer word. Did they remove it? Are you in remission? Chemo? People don't realize all the other trials and trauma and missing school and losing 30 pounds and you can't eat. And then you're going through withdrawal from morphine. And it's just no, there's no yeah. handbook. Nobody tells you this stuff. It was, it was, yeah, it was tough. How did you, for lack of a better word, mentally get through the, that, those 12 days in the hospital where you're starving and on morphine yeah. and going through withdrawal? Music, a lot of music. Oh, I, awesome. I would take I would take the uh, cart, you know how you hooked up to the IV and everything, and I would do laps around the um, the floor, the whole floor, and I would keep going, and I would listen to music the whole time, and I would just, and you know it was a big song. I uh, remember Mesmerized by Ja Rule and Ashanti. That was a big one. That that, <laughs> and I had that play, and I'll never forget that song because when it plays now, I think of those time. that yeah, and that walk around. You have no calories in you, and you're basically doing exercise yeah. in the hospital. Yeah. Yep. And I'll never forget that. And they put you, after you leave, I think it was like on a, a five gram a day diet. And I remember looking at like these bagel chips. I'm like, oh, I want one of those. And I look at the calories. I'm like, oh, it's more than five grams. I for have. one. Yeah, for one. For one. And I was like, oh, God. Now you finish the surgery. You get out of the hospital. You're 40 pounds under what you went into the hospital with, and then you get to go right back to school? I came back junior year, oh, right. got on back was, on the team for a little bit, and then they told me that I had to get um, uh, the chemotherapy. It skipped my lymph nodes and moved to my lung. How long after that surgery did they tell you that the 96% you were in the 4%, the 4% <laughs> that it comes back? How long did you have at that time? So it was about a month and a half, give or take. Did you start to feel like yourself then? Like you're starting to I was eat again all right. then? You were yeah, starting to eat I, again, put some weight back on? Yeah, yeah. I was starting to, you know, kind of get back into my routine a little bit. Basketball? It, it, or, the recovery was a while because like they cut me. It, that recovery from what I remember, it was at least a month. So you really only had a week or two where you were kind yeah. of on the end of the recovery where you find you get hit with the more. Yeah, it was only a few That's weeks. Three. So it's, it's cancer three, it's three announcements of cancer. Well, two announcements. One is the yeah. lymph node surgery. It's chemotherapy scared me more than the surgeries did, to be honest. Why? I knew people were going to know that I was sick. And I, I, with the surgeries and stuff, you could always kind of hide. It didn't affect, even though it affected the weight, it didn't affect my face. Well, it's kind of drawn in, of course, but it didn't. People didn't know. You had your hair. Right. So now you hear about the chemo, but they don't have to do any removal or dissections of the lung. They just want to do no. chemo to get it from growing in the lung and get it out of there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So then you start chemo um, when? March 2003. So I, it was on my March 17th, my birthday, St. Patrick's Day. Oh, yeah. No kidding. <laughs> okay. So um, I, I sent you a couple of photos. That was like my first day of chemo. So... My friend Christy came with me. My Photo mother. Like this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was a couple months before. That's but a good attitude, the one, though. That's a good yeah. attitude heading into chemo. Yeah, that one was right before I got diagnosed. The ones where I'm sitting down with my friend and stuff like that. Uh -oh. That was my first day. So they came and showed great support, um, and it didn't affect me for for a little bit until like um, a few sessions. It was one week on, two weeks off, four times again told me about walking around the hospital, listening to music. How did you remain 
focused, positive while you're going through the chemo sickness? <laughs> that that part, to be honest, it was tough. At first, go, I'm like, oh, you know what? I, I can do this. You know, my hair wasn't falling out. Um, my my strength was pretty, pretty good. You know, I wasn't even feeling like side effects yet. At first. Yeah. So after a little bit of that, one day I take off my shirt and I had pimples all over my back. It was bad. Like I was like, man, what's going to happen to me? You know? And what some people don't realize too, because you see, you know, it affects your, 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 the top of your head. But like one day I was like this I, and then my facial hair just came out and I was like, what the fuck? What the fuck? What the fuck? So that was a traumatic experience too. And then all of a sudden then my eyebrows and stuff and, I felt, honestly, and I, I'm not a, a vain person in any way, but I felt really disgusting. They didn't want you to exercise because if you got hit, like you're playing basketball, for instance, you could get internal bleeding and stuff. I mean, I, I started to play anyway because I, I said, you know, if I can't be myself, then I'm I, I'm not doing Like, I have to do stuff that makes me happy to stay positive. I can't just do nothing, you know? How was your basketball skills? <laughs> not as good as I remembered them at that You're point. You're a shooter. Shooter <laughs> shoots. You know what? Because it's funny because during, well, it's not funny, but during chemo and stuff, you think that, you know, you lose the weight, right? And I lost it with my surgeries, but the chemotherapy, I actually gained weight. I was eating very bad. Whatever it didn't cause me acid reflux, right. I was eating. And some, and a lot of stuff was really bad. So I lose my hair, my eyebrows, gaining weight. You know, I got pimples all over my back. And I'm like, man, what, what am I, what's going on? You know? So at that point I was like, I, I got to do something that makes me happy. And it was playing basketball. It was just my friends and family were very, cause it kept me occupied. I would, I would be out all the time. Whenever I had strength, I was out. I was having fun. Staying my out. mind was off it. Your survival instinct for your mental health was to stay active. Yeah. Did you have a girlfriend at the time? No, no, I didn't have did a you, girlfriend. Did you retreat from like sort of the dating scene? I don't know if you were dating before that. Were you shy about that? Was, <sighs> I how, did, how did that experience go? And I had like a reserved attitude to it. And I'm like, man, no girls are going to like me like this. And I, I truly carried that until one of my friends, she was like, oh, you know, this girl likes you. And she was one of the prettiest girls that I, and I'm like, really? I couldn't even believe it, to be honest with you. Because I'm like, what's there to like about me? I, I, that's how oh, I felt. Oh. Yeah. I really felt that way. And it's, Did and I you go think, out with her? No, I didn't. <laughs> Why not? There was something that I just was lacking at the time that I just didn't pursue it. And it just kind of passed by. Once you got through the treatment and they were like, when did they tell you you were cancer free and you're good and you just have to get, I think it's like MRIs and stuff yeah. every mm -hmm. three months, every six months or yes. something. And do you still have to do that? I had to go every month to begin with for the first year every month and then it was every three months and then six months then every year and like you still that. do it yearly now uh i think it was a year and a half ago maybe two years ago i finally my doctor was like i don't need to see you anymore you're you know and you're 37 yeah. now yeah every time you went in for the last 20 years did you think oh god i hope it doesn't come back or you're like this is my routine every time i put on that uh gown to go do the chest x-ray i would talk to myself and i i'd, I'd you know, kind of say a prayer and I'd just be like, please let everything be okay. Because just being there, it, I don't know if it's a PTSD or yeah, just it reminded a, you. Yeah, it did remind me because it would be in that, in the same place that I was, you know, I and I'm that. like, and then you see other people who are going through it in the present. You know, you take it a second to, to think about yourself you too. to them. Some people, you know, I always say, you know, swap stories. Yeah. Uh, encouragement. Yeah. Because there was somebody who spoke to me beforehand that went to, I went to Tonville High School. He went to Port Richmond High School. And he was, we were the same age. And, and they put us in touch. Yeah. And did that help at the time? It helped. Yeah. Did your grandfather impart any wisdom during this time? Besides being, a, you know, a great supportive guy. He was very laid back. He was the person I'd go to and speak about anything. You know, he understood everything. He was someone who would get his point across with and you didn't want to disappoint him mm -hmm. so that's like kind of the best way to go about things because you're not even doing it for yourself you're kind of doing it not to disappoint <laughs> and get in trouble you know so he had you know when i was younger i would get into just trouble like mischievous stuff at school and stuff 
And when I go by and the teacher would call the house and I, I didn't want to get into trouble and I would just, I just lie. <laughs> like, Oh no, I didn't. So he goes, Oh, okay. You know, and he would take my side and then I would feel so bad that he was taking my side that I'd be like, no, and I would tell the truth. <laughs> and I'd be like, I, I felt so bad. I'm like, I'm like, I didn't even expect them to believe me. She was like, you know what? You should be an actor one day, you know? And and that's what always clicked into my mind. Like, that was the moment. Yeah, no, he, he meant it, yeah. Since I missed a lot of classes in junior year, I graduated on time, thank God, but I had like remedial stuff in You're college. Behind. And and the only classes that I liked were drama. So. Like, how do, how do I college. go about this? A good college is that now on CSI. Nice. Because I didn't have the guidance either. I didn't know what I wanted to do. I didn't have time to think about it from when I was sick till all of a sudden you're taking your SATs and all this stuff. And I missed so much class. I didn't have time to think about what I, like, was there anything else like that I really wanted to do to go to college for? So you're like, so you're liking your drama classes. Are you doing acting classes? Are you doing plays? I, I started you... taking acting classes. So I'm like, all right, how do you go about this, right? So I just started applying to like um, student films and things yeah, like that, independent films. And I had decent enough roles to like, I was, you know, leading in, in filming and supporting. So I had some good material for, to create a reel. And so I submit for like this modeling thing on Craigslist. Craigslist and a... yeah, <laughs> like I, I don't even know if, what's going on there now, but at that point, you know, I submitted there. And this photographer gets back to me and he's like, oh, I really like your look. You know, would you like to do um, a, a test shoot or whatever? I have a lot of connections to different agencies, things like that. Would you want to? So I'm like, oh, God, I, I got to go there and something bad's going to happen to me. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, all right, <laughs> I was prepared. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so I go. Uh, it, was my, it was a good friend of mine still, Eugene. Um, very good photographer, very talented, works with a lot of agencies, was, was the truth. So from there, I signed... Uh, this modeling agency at the time was Renegade. Then I went to Click Major Models, and that's when I ended up with with Wilhelmina. And through this whole time, I'm doing the student films and getting getting roles in those things, and I'm building my reel. So a friend of mine calls me one day, and it's like, "Oh, uh, you know, there's this open call for this film. Uh, you know, you want to go?" I'm like, "Ah, oh, I don't know." I'm like, "You going?" He's like, "Yeah." I'm like, "All right." So he picks me up, we go, and it was this film that wound up being this film called Joe's War, and they already had the lead cast. So I'm like, all right, well, we did um, cold reads, wound up getting a call saying, oh, you know, can you come back or whatever? Uh, we'd like you to, to read for the lead. You know, like, so long story short, I wound up getting that role. They, they took the person that they had, and they moved them to a different role, and I wound up, you know, getting the lead this role. Your first film audition? It was my first like real, real film, not yeah, like real film, yeah, paid film, paid gig. I got paid the other ones, like the the other the films, films, the student films, and I did a couple indies. Uh, other than that, nice. so from there I wound up, you know, booking that role, and, and then from there uh, Armand Asante was in it at, at the late Ed Asner, the late uh, Tom Sizemore. I so I saw some scenes. Yeah, so it was good, it was great, it, great experience. You know, they really took me, um, and they were their... cool with your inexperience too. They were like, oh, they were like, yeah, it was, you're a good dude. And yeah. Like prepared. And Ed Asner became like a, a mentor to me. He would always, okay. yeah, he would always, he, when he saw the film at the, at, um, one of the film festivals, he called me up. He's like, I, I just saw the film. You did great. Like, I think I still have that, that voicemail. Thank your friend who drove you to the audition. Yes. And my, we talk about it all the time. I, I want people to understand when I say thank you to them, that it really meant something to me because they might not understand how much it meant, you know, and how much you carry that with you on a daily basis. So it's important to me that I let them know that, wow, thank you so much. You know, helping others feels great. It's yeah. the best feeling in the world getting appreciated is the bonus. It's the same thing, not being transactional for it. It's the, I'm telling you, Ed Asner and Armando Sante, they got pleasure um, in guiding a young, a young artist. They, because, because they saw a good egg. They saw a talented, good egg who was humble and willing to learn. I'm assuming that I can just, I can just oh, tell that you. about you. That, yeah. that, so, so then people want to volunteer to, in your life. It's something I always, take with me. And then what happened was then I was still with Wilhelmina at the time for modeling, but it was always kind of like a springboard. I wanted to use that, you know, and I did 
to, to mention about the fitness, like when I first signed with them, I did like 10 pages of men's journal magazine and things like that. Oh, people need to know just how insanely fit, like we're talking like fitness, like looks like 0% body fat. That's something you had before you got signed by Wilhelmina or you leaned into after you got signed? It was, it was something I, I always worked on kind of. And since with high those, school, when you were healthy, you always worked on it. Yeah, it was but it was, one of those it was things. like you go up and down, you know, because it's hard to stay agree. that. So if I know that one, the, the men's journal, I only knew the day before. So luckily I was, <laughs> I was in good shape. And, you know, it just makes me feel good. Mm -hmm. And then from there was when I was able to get a reel and then get my first manager. Right. So from there it was, okay, now it, it kind of was like, now you're entering the, the television stuff, the bigger films and, and things like that. So it was very exciting. Honestly, you get that feeling of your first types of yeah. real auditions and, and not real, but like stepping in the arena. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah, you know, you're in the game. Yeah, I remember you know? my first Law and Order audition. My first Law and Order booking was like, "All right, I'm a I'm a New York actor." I just guest starred on Law and Order uh, Organized Crime. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. Organized Crime, yeah, it just yeah. aired, right? Look yeah, yeah. Look it up. Yeah. Um, and who did you play? I played Deacon. He's uh, episode fifteen of season Do you three. Think there's an irony that I know you played like that. You've played so many kind of tough guys and yeah. bad guys and <laughs> kind of you know a, you know you're a sweet. Guy. I, I love I I really do love it. Cause it, it, it is a little, it's a lot different than my regular personality, you know? So I, I just like, like, and I'm sure, do you like to play like a diverse group of, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm playing a guy that, right now and, uh, and I'm, I'm still feeling the dimensions out of it. Cause I'm actually not used to it. He's playing, I'm playing, um, sort of a, sort of a, like a tough blowhard, uh, DEA boss. Who's just like perpetually stressed and annoyed. And he's just like, he says no a lot. Right. He's not, you know lighthearted and fun. Like I, you know, yeah. like the last few roles, right. I've done. but it's awesome. It's awesome. It's teaching me about stuff. It's forcing me to work in a different way. It's, That's awesome. But your father, yes. nine and a half months. Nine and a half months. What was your reaction when you found out your wife was pregnant? And what was your reaction when you saw your son born? The whole process was tough, was tough because she had a very hard time getting pregnant. We're going through IVF treatments and nothing was working on her all the medicines, the hormones, everything, nothing was working. And I had my sperm tested, everything was fine and everything. So she wound up during the pandemic finding a functional fertility coach mm -hmm. and they take your blood, urine, stool, hair, everything. And they analyze everything to a T and they see what you might be allergic to because in women, you could be eating stuff that you're allergic to and it could be causing inflammation throughout the body that they don't know about and causing you not to get pregnant. They put her on a um, specific diet according to her allergies. And they were like, we've never seen anybody with this many allergies to like stuff you wouldn't even think of that you're eating on a health daily journey. basis. A health journey. Yeah. She went on a diet for like six months to the T. And we went to the doctor and it was, we were considering donor eggs. So they check her out and it was as if nothing was wrong. We did years, a couple years of all the hormones, everything. Nothing worked. And then when we found, finally found out, we, you know, we did the genetic testing with the embryos and all that mm -hmm. stuff. Thank God, everything good. So we had four, three were boys, one was girl. So those are frozen, but we had one and we said, put in the strongest one, the grade. And that wound up being uh, little Mikey. So Mikey Jr. Yeah, yeah. Do you go by Mike and he's Mikey? Yeah, Mike. Yeah, he's Mike. I call him Mikey or Michael, but I usually call him Mikey. I'm imagining. I'm just, I don't put words in it. Uh, becomes a, being a father is now the number one job of your life. Yeah. Yeah. Hands down. When he was born, I was like, it was a love that I never, th it's like a different type of feeling, you know? Yeah. And I was like, man, but it made my, it made my will to, to win even bigger because I'm like, I have to show this little guy, what following your dreams can become. Because if he comes to me and says, you know, this is what I want to do, I'm going to support him no matter what. But you want to show an example of, you know what, if you work hard, this is what could come of it. Describe your perfect day. You know, a perfect day, I'd say, is just being able to, besides work, just being able to spend time with the family, hang out, relax, recover, and just uh, spend some quality time and then know that the whole week is going to be 
work, work, work and get things done. But also you need that day to recover and um, spend time with the people you care about. Is there anything else you would like to say to anyone who might be listening or watching? I know that life is tough for everybody. We all have our problems and, you know, on a daily basis. But if you really love something, you find the way to do it. Don't give up and don't quit and just keep going because better days are ahead. Warrior, survivor, dad, actor, <laughs> model, fitness guru, positive guy. The man right here. The man. My dude. My brother. Thank you so much for having me. Really pleasure. Thank you. Time.